Well, in our series on God, the unexpected, uh, we're in Second Kings, the fourth chapter today. God, the unexpected, working with what seems just nothing at all and how God is at work in power and in provision, showing his great love. So just seven verses today. I made Jay do the hard work this morning. I'll read uh, chapter four in Second Kings, verses one through seven. Listen for the word of the Lord. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him, and afterward shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> well, once there was a young family, a young family of four, and they were struggling a little bit, having trouble making ends meet. The husband and father had a very important job, but it paid really poorly. They also had a small farm, and so they would work on the land, and they would try to produce enough food for the family, and also a little something in order to make ends meet, because this job paid so poorly. In order to get along, they started having to borrow money, and they ended up borrowing quite a lot of money. But they were young, and they figured they would have time to pay it back. Eventually, if they worked long enough and hard enough, it was not unrealistic to think that they could pay it back. Except something happened. The husband and the father died, and he left his wife and his two young sons, who did not have the means to pay back the debt. So far, not too foreign from our experience, not too unusual a story. Young family trying to make their way, taking on debt and finding themselves pinched, finding themselves stuck along the way. You or someone you know may have faced a similar situation, found yourselves in a similar position. I know some people who are super bright, more educated than they had any right to be, who found themselves in an incredible amount of debt, found themselves wondering how they would ever be able to pay off tens of thousands of dollars in credit card bills. And that's several people I know, actually. You may know someone like that. You may know a country that's wondering how it's going to settle its debts in the end. That may be weighing on your minds a little bit. Not too different, but here is the difference. Here's where it's not familiar to us and why I had Jay read that passage from Leviticus. This woman's debt ceiling cannot be raised. She cannot borrow more money. She has borrowed more than she can pay back. They will not loan her any more. She cannot pay off this debt. She is likely unable to work to pay off this debt. And her sons are not old enough to work to pay off the debt. If they were a little bit older, they would work the family land. And two young men working the family land ought to be enough not only for them to survive, but to begin paying back this huge debt that their family has incurred. Here's the other thing that's different. If her sons are taken, which is a very real possibility, an immediate crisis in her life, she will never be able to pay back the debt, nor will she ever be able to get her sons back. Leviticus provides for a situation in which people are in need and they need to find some way to pay off a debt and they can sell themselves to other Israelites, your countrymen, Leviticus says. But it's not supposed to be permanent and they're not supposed to be slaves. And as Jay read, at the year of the Jubilee, when the Jubilee comes, they're to be released. It's also the year that all debts are forgiven. The people of God were very good at taking on countrymen to be their hired servants. Whether they were any good at not treating them as slaves, we do not know. But we also are pretty sure they never, ever celebrated the year of Jubilee, where they forgave debts and were hired Countrymen, hired servants, indentured servants, basically, were ever released. 
They kind of liked having people work for them. They kind of liked calling in debts this way. And they kind of didn't like this provision that God had made that at the year of Jubilee, all debts are forgiven and all people go back to their land. Why? Because if you work the land, then you can pay for food, for clothing, for shelter, pay off debts. Her sons are about to be taken. It will ruin everything. She will not be able to get them back. She will not be able to pay off the debt. And her sons will stay with whoever is coming, this creditor, not just till the debt's paid off, but probably that will be their life. This is where she finds herself. She's at the end of a rope. She's out of time. And she's out of options. So what's she going to do? She's actually tried a lot already. She did not find herself in this crisis and then to kind of go along thinking eventually it would be okay. She's been doing things. She has nothing left to do. What is she going to do now? In her dire straits, in her desperation, she goes to Elisha and she acts. And she does a really hard thing because nobody likes to ask for help. None of us likes to be to have to admit that we are not able to make ends meet, that we are not able to face this challenge, that we are not able to make our way in the world the way it looks like everybody else is able to do relatively reasonably, easily, which is never true, right? Nobody wants to ask for help. But she's done all she can do. At least she thinks that. She thinks she's done everything. Elisha is going to ask her to do more and ask her to do more that is even harder than what she's done already. But Elisha is not a bad guy. Look at his response to the widow, the widow of his servant. This is one of the company of prophets who worked with Elisha. He knew the man. He knew the family almost certainly. And he did know that as the wife and the widow said, he revered the Lord. This man who had died revered the Lord. He takes her seriously and he understands the urgency His creditor is coming to take my two boys as slaves. And immediately he says, what can I do for you? How can I help you? What do you have in the house? He knows the culture. He knows the situation. He knows how important it is that we deal with this right now because he is probably on his way within a day or so is coming and he will take her boys with her with him and she will maybe never see them again. And these are young uh, boys along the way, by the way. These are not ones able to work for a living. Urgency. How can I help you? What do you have in the house? He knows we need to act quickly here. And we get to the next crisis, the next turning point in this really short, very dramatic story. What's going to happen next? What do you have? Nothing. Nothing at all. There is nothing there at all except a little oil. I have nothing in the house. Her house and her pantry are bare. She has either sold everything she has to try to make their way in the world and maybe pay off some of the debt. What food she had, she has given to her children. She is not storing up food because all she's got left is a little oil and she is assuming that the boys are going to be taking away. She has no way to provide for herself, which is why over and over and over again, God says to his people, take care of the widows and the orphans and the aliens, the strangers in your midst, because they can't support themselves in this culture. She's got nothing left, nothing Nothing there at all, except a little oil. Well, I learned something this uh, this fall along the way. My parents are here today. That's a joy for us. Joy and concerns. Joy. Here's the concern. They started listening to my sermons online, which is great. If you don't talk about your family in the sermon. Wendy and I were traveling somewhere, got a text from my mom. She was working in the computer room cleaning up, and she said, I'm listening to my favorite preacher. And I thought, well, I like their priest a lot, too. But I wonder if she means somebody else. And I thought, oh, that's really flattering. But something in the back of my head said, that's not good. And I couldn't remember why. Another text comes in. Good to know we're not really hoarders. (laughs) Dave, I don't know how many sermons you've got online. That was what's in the back of my head. I think I said something recently. Not only did I compare them to hoarders, but say they weren't. I also said all my siblings are within an hour. And so when it comes time to deal with all this stuff, I'm going to be far away. That's the one she was listening to. (laughs) Because they're here, I will tell one story about my family and not two. The other you've already heard, but they don't know that you've heard it. So we'll talk about that later. (laughs) Here's what I remember. I remember the first time my dad explained to me how an atomic bomb worked. And I could tell you the general concept. I do not understand. I do not understand how they figured out that this tiny little atom could somehow be split and release this enormous amount of energy. 
And having understood that they could do that, I have no idea how you go about doing it now. I still don't know. I mean, I know, but I don't understand how it is that you could split an atom and this tremendous explosion comes about. This tiny little thing, this atom, tremendous amount of energy. And at the time, of course, when I first heard it, smallest bit of an element, right? The smallest little bit of something you can have as an atom. And I knew it was made up of things. But in the years since the first explanation of an atomic bomb, I've learned there are other things swimming around, spinning around in atoms that I do not understand. I could not tell you what a quark is. I know the word. So when I watch the Big Bang Theory, I feel smart because I've heard of a quark. I don't know what it is, but I've heard of it. This week, finally, we have recognition for a tiny little thing, the Higgs boson, right? The tiny little particle. You've heard it called the God particle. Physicists do not like that name. Pastors don't like that name either. It is not this tiny little particle that gives mass to everything in the universe. It is the God of the universe who gives mass to everything that he created in the universe. But at least we know now the Nobel Prize has been given to recognize the people who in 1964 said, I think there's something in there and it's going to do this. And they saw it last July, not 2013, 2012. And now Dr. Higgs has gotten his Nobel Prize. Don't miss the point. My point is not that in small things there is a tremendous amount of energy, that in small things there's a tremendous amount of power. That's not the point here. So this tiny little bit of oil, somehow within the oil itself, there's enough to provide for all this family because there's not. Here's part of the point. We're getting at the point. God doesn't need much to do an awful lot. God doesn't need very much to do an awful lot. In fact, he can do a lot with nothing at all. What have you got in your house? Tell me, what have you got there? Nothing. Nothing at all, except a little oil. Here's good news. God can make everything out of nothing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was nothing, and he said, let there be, and there was. He can create everything out of nothing. Jesus said to the disciples, don't you remember? We had 5,000 men. Women and children were extra. 5,000 men. We had five loaves. How many baskets of leftovers did you pick up? We were 12. And after that, there were 4,000 men plus the women and children. We had seven loaves, a few fish, sure. How many baskets of leftovers did you pick up? Seven. And he said, do you still not understand? God doesn't need a lot to do an awful lot. He doesn't need much to do an awful lot. It was not because the oil had within itself enough to make itself into something tremendous and abundant. It's because God was at work in the situation. So now we know she has gone to the man of God, the prophet Elisha, who worships and speaks for a God who can create all things out of nothing. So this little bit of oil holds a lot of promise in this situation. But she's got to do something. He's going to ask her to do something hard. And she's been living a hard life for however long it's been since the time that her husband died to the crisis with the debt. She's gone through all of this, losing her husband, dealing with worrying, how is she going to pay it back, all these things. And finally, she goes to Elisha. This is her last resort. He is her last hope. If he doesn't do something, there is nothing left to be done. If this doesn't work, everything is lost. And he asks her to do something, to step out in faith. Go and ask your neighbors. He doesn't say, if they ask why it is you need the empty jars, you have to tell them because I've got this debt that I can't pay and my sons are going to be taken away. But she is still vulnerable in having to go and ask other people for something like she hasn't had to rely on help along the way. Go and ask your neighbors. Go and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Most important part of the story at this point, don't ask for just a few. Go ask all your neighbors for empty jars. And she does it. She responds in faith and she does this hard thing. And, you know, that's not the point either, right? It's not that she found within herself the confidence to step out there and do a hard thing. And because of it, God rewarded her and everything was fine. It's not because she was assertive. It was not because she was self-confident. It's not because she she was self-sufficient in any way that this situation was transformed. Not what she did But what God did, she acted in faith and not faith in herself, but faith in the word of the man of God, the prophet of God who speaks God's word to God's people. The final thing that's not the point is it's not because she found the right guy. If I just go to the right person, they'll have the right solution and then the problem will be solved. And so good thing I picked Elisha. Boy, it was close, but Elisha happened to have the answer. He had the plan. And that's not the point either. Here's the point. She trusted in God who can make all things 
out of nothing and who, according to the word of his prophet, the man of God, Elisha, can transform this tiny amount of oil into an abundance. Nothing, nothing there at all, except a little oil. And God acted in power. He can take that little bit of oil and do tremendous things. One of my favorite parts of the story is she kept pouring. Hand me another jar. She kept pouring. Hand me another jar. Can you imagine what it was like to be in that room? Tiny bit of oil. Every jar she fills up. Hand me another jar. Hand me another jar. Until finally her son says, there are no jars left. We've used them all. They're all full. And then the oil stopped flowing. When there was not a jar left, that's when the oil stopped flowing. Nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing there at all except a little oil. And out of that little oil, her debts are paid. She and her sons can live. And more than that, they can live on what is left over after the debt's been paid. After she pays off this huge debt, they have enough to live on, presumably until the sons are able to support her. But regardless, God did not say, OK, I see that you need to make it to this day. And so I'm going to give you enough oil till then. And then you're on your own again. Pay off your debt. You can live on what is left over. They can live. Jesus told his disciples, do not worry. Don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. Don't worry about your body, what you're going to wear. People who don't believe in God are the ones always fretting and worrying about these things. They run after these things. Elisha ran after Elijah. And Elijah and Elisha run after God. People who don't believe in God worry and run after what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. Your Father in heaven knows that you need them. He knows already what you need. This woman trusted in God who made all things out of nothing. Nothing at all. What you got in your house? Nothing at all. That's a good place to start. With the God who can make all things out of nothing. Who can transform what is little into an abundance. This is the God that's at work in this world, not 2,800 years ago, but today too. This is the God at work in our lives who can take the tiniest amount and transform it into an abundance. Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it would go. He can do an awful lot with not very much. This is the God we worship, the God we serve. This is the God in whom we also can trust. This widow trusted in the God who could do all things and do all things out of nothing. This is the God we're called to worship and serve and trust in also. Which is a good place to end the sermon. But I want to ask you a question first. I have a question for you. If it was you, if you were in that position and the man of God said, go ask all your neighbors, ask them for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. How many jars would you ask for? If God can create all things out of nothing, if this abundance is coming, how many jars would you be bold enough to ask for? Let's pray together. God, be at work in our lives. Grant us your grace to be bold in our prayers. Grant us grace to trust in you at all times. It is far too easy to trust in ourselves. And it's far too easy when we find ourselves in over our heads to try to get out on our own, refusing help that is offered to us. When we were in bondage to sin and death, when we were lost, when we were dead, we could not do it on our own, but you did for us what we could not do. When there was nothing, you said, let there be, and there was. Help us to run after a God who can create all things out of nothing, who can turn a tiny amount into a huge abundance, overflowing with blessing. Help us to have faith that is bold 